Yo guys, what's up? The Schiller here. We're hanging out with Nick and this is going to be a series that we're going to do and it's uh, one that we're going to try to do bi-weekly and it's going to be a talk about Guild of Guardians uh, and it's going to be called Into the Guild. Hello there. So Nick, give us a little bit of a background about what you do for Guild of Guardians. Yep, lovely to be here. Uh, very excited for the new the new segment that you've got running, Schill. Um, we've been working this concept for a little while. So I'm Nick. I run the marketing for the game for Guild of Guardians, which is... Um, the elevator pitch essentially is that it's the, the most hyped upcoming mobile NFT game on the planet. It's a dungeon crawler RPG. We've done around 30 mil US in, in primary and secondary trading. Um, and we're, we're going to melt faces in 2022, essentially. <laughs> Yo, it's exciting. But I mean, we're, we're, we're in a spa right now where play to earn is kind of the talk on everybody's mind, right? Like I think back in 2021, it was kind of the first, hey, here's let's solidify what NFTs are for. And then it was kind of the reminder of like, hey, you know, NFTs, the best use case for them is for video games. And you guys are focusing primarily on mobile. So do you know why you guys did that? I mean, obviously, there's a lot of players that do that. But is it easier to create a mobile game? versus PC or are you just looking for a bigger outreach? Um, I think it's it's not to do with ease. I think that game development in and of itself is really difficult. And that's something that obviously our our dev team is tasked with and we've got a sort of best in class world leading group on that front. I think it goes to your second point on accessibility. Um, you know, there are literally hundreds of millions of mobile gamers in the world. Mobile phones now are sort of uniform across in terms of accessibility from, from all corners of the globe. Whereas I think if you wanted to go towards the, the sort of super high end graphic play with, um, with I guess, interesting console and PC elements, you, you get into a, a situation where you're building a barrier to entry because not everyone has top of the line gaming rigs and not everyone has PS4s or PS5s um, or Xboxes or, or what be. So I think with us, it was the sort of situation where we thought we could build something compelling, keep the graphic specs and, and graphic requirements relatively lean um, and that meant that people from from all corners of the planet could play and experience what we were trying to build so you guys are called guild of guardians and obviously that results in you guys having these guilds that have been for sale and i'm kind of curious because you guys have multiple different ones and the game's guild of guardians it seems that the amount of players that you guys potentially are going to have is going to outnumber the guilds currently available so can you talk about kind of just how the guild dynamic works because it sounds like there's going to be you know upwards of 20 people to uh 40 that can end up joining the guild and then the owners of a guild to get a percentage of all the crafted material for that. And apparently that's going to be in an ETH uh, payout, which is super, super cool. But how is it going to work if, if guilds are supposed to be the mainstay and there might not be enough guilds for the amount of players? Yeah, great question. So I think for some context to explain how the guilds work. So our sort of steadfast desire since we started building this from day one was that we wanted GOG to be a multiplayer game. So we want players to, to be able to earn big and collect everything and, complete the game and, and the people that want to do that will want to join a guild because that unlocks a number of different elements, a number of different game modes that are only accessible to guild members. Um, it's worth noting that the game is entirely free to play and you can play solo, but we're obviously trying to sort of siphon people towards the concept of playing in groups. Um, now, touching on the point that you just made, we sold founders editions of our guilds. So there's the there's four tiers, adventurers, warriors, legends, and, and the mythic guilds. Um, and it goes from 20 members up to 50 members, so 20, 30, 40, 50. The guild owner of the different tiers of guilds get access to a guaranteed first cut of any sale. Uh, so for the Adventurers Guild, it's 1%, Warriors 2.5%, Legends 5%, and the Mythic is 10%. And obviously, when we sold these like nine, 10 months ago, um, the, the prices were reflected. So Adventurers Guilds, I think, started at 200 US and ended up being 250 US after this discount that we ran. And then Mythic Guilds ended up being a hundred thousand US dollars for the for the last one we sold. So there were only ten of those. Now, uh, to address your question about what happens when we onboard more players than there are guilds to facilitate, we basically have reserved the right to say that we'll never mint Warriors, Legends, or Mythic Guilds again, and we'll never mint, in principle, any Founders items ever again. So the guilds that we've sold, the Founders edition of these guilds, are there. They're done. That's it. However, we have reserved the right to come up with whatever you want to call it, other mechanics, other guild mechanics to be able to facilitate um, the onboarding of new players. So what that probably looks like is coming up with um, a new non-founder guild to uh, to basically facilitate that. So people needn't worry. I just think the main thing to note is that 
the people who bought founder assets um, have those protected, essentially. I got like a founder's uh, clothing piece in the uh, closet as well when you guys first dropped that. And I thought that, you know, nobody was really paying attention to it at the time. And, you know, I want to talk about energy tokens and whatnot here in a second. But are you guys going to do extra merch drops? Because I know within the NFT space, that's been a huge hot commodity. But for, you know, a, a company like you guys, where you're labeled first as kind of like a game company, is merch really top of mind at all? Um, look, I think it is because, I mean, we will, we'll, we will definitely be doing more merch drops. We'll be doing, uh, we, we want to experiment with a few different things. I think merch is good um, and, it, and it obviously enables and, and sort of bonds the sense of community that we're trying to build, but we're trying to do a, a number of different things. And I think it comes back to the point where, you know, at heart where we're a gaming project, but the game is is really sort of the medium or the avenue to um, connections and community building, which is what we're quite bullish on. That's our thesis for for long-term success. So I think anything you do on that front, be it merch drops, be it IRL meetups, be it um, facilitating ways for people to connect with one another from from all corners of the planet, that's the more that we can do to, to funnel people um, into those areas and, and, and facilitate that, the better. So short answer, yes, we will definitely be doing stuff like more merch drops, but that's sort of the that's the baseline. We've got a lot more. <laughs> We've got a lot more to do on top of that. Yeah, no, I'm a huge merch fan, and that's awesome to see. So, I one thing like for anyone that happens to be tuning in right now that's never really seen kind of how the marketplace works for Gilded Guardians, the site that I'm using right now is Token Trove, and it's not uh, the the official marketplace that's being used, but it's one that lays it out a little bit better. Um, and I'll show the uh, Immutable X one here in a second. But uh, Nick, for these energy tokens, it's something that a lot of players are going to want, or you know, potentially even need if they're wanting to play the game. From my understanding and the fact there's only 275 of them listed i'm like wow okay that's an incredibly low supply for it what are energy tokens supposed to do in the game so basically gog uses an energy system um it's like any sort of dungeon crawler it refills over time and then it's depleted when you enter a dungeon so that's like normal cooldown situations fatigue um as any sort of native gamer would understand or for people who haven't perhaps played those games before you go in, the energy system refills over time and then it depletes when you go into a dungeon. So with traditional sort of free-to-play games, you players would, I don't know if you know people played Candy Crush or Angry Birds or whatever, they were always in-app purchases, $2.99 or $4.99 or $6.99, whatever, to get stuff, be it gems, be it, um, you know, in Clash of Clans, if you wanted to go and do another raid, you had to buy tokens or buy in-game assets, items to go and facilitate uh, the ability to do that. And so obviously the difference there goes back to our core principle, which is like, you should never spend money on in a game that you can't see a return on, or you can't own the asset properly, which is the, the underlying thesis of what we're doing. But going back to your point about energy boosters, in GOG, there's a sort of unique energy mechanic. So we have these energy booster NFTs, and they are NFTs, um, which basically provide a permanent boost to your energy. Um, and... On top of that, so I spoke about how you have that um, energy system which refills. Heroes, which you use in-game, they'll get fatigued if you enter a dungeon too many times in one day, which causes them to suffer like stat reductions, penalties essentially, or require extra energy. So to summarize, those energy boosters which you're showing now, they will remove the fatigue rate that a, um, a, a hero would suffer. So that would like that would lessen that impact. Um, and then it would allow then players to use their favorite heroes for a longer period of time without suffering those penalties to their stats. And it's only one per account from my understanding as well. Is that right? Yeah, that's going to be spicy when that, when that launches for sure. So we talked a second ago about the uh, marketplace. And for you guys, you're actually on a layer two here with Immutable X. It's not necessarily your own specific Guild of Guardians marketplace. But I mean, with you guys partnering here with Immutable X, is there going to be in-game assets where you guys have your kind of like own marketplace within the game? Or is it always going to end up being here on Immutable? So the secondary marketplace, the, the reason why we use Immutable and the game is published by Immutable with Immutable, so, which is exciting. You know, Immutable is probably one of the biggest L2s in the space. Um, super well funded and have made a lot of noise in the last year. So the game's published by Immutable and then developed by a company called Stepico in the Ukraine. Sorry, I'm just giving context as I run, but um, no. So this is the secondary marketplace. This is where assets will go. This is where crafted items will go. And this is the marketplace that people will use to be able to purchase and facilitate purchases. Um, the the good part about Immutable X is that it's gas free. 
So you don't pay any, you don't pay a cent of gas on transactions, which was something that was very important to us because if you're buying a, you know, a two or three dollar item down the track, then if you had a gas fee that was equal to, if not more than what the item costs, it's like, well, the game flops before it starts. So this is Immutable X that you're showing here. Um, token Trove, as, as you had up before, Token Trove is basically just a, a different UI of the same backend, if that makes sense. Yeah, and one thing that I find like a little bit confusing uh, for this, I'm curious if it's ever going to kind of like get addressed is because when we go in here and we try to find a pet, right? Obviously, for anyone that's new to the game, you'd look and go to the side and be like, okay, let's figure out the type. And then it's a whole bunch of numbers. And for the class, you have hunters, scouts, workers, which is going to be more obvious when the game comes out and you're able to use it. But for these types, with the fact that they're kind of numbered, do you know if these are going to get updated at all to be more um, user friendly, per se, instead of just a number? Oh, yeah, for sure. So I think Immutable X had such massive scale at the end of last year that they're like, you know, it's the double-edged sword where whenever you grow very quickly, there's good and bad things that come with it. So, you know, they're working over time on, on just padding out the UI and making it better and better. So, you know, what you see here is very much a whip um, not on that front. <laughs> but, but we're in a situation where, like, you know, this will look entirely different in six months. Um and yeah, it's, it's only going to get better. But that's why Token Trove has been a really good stopgap for the time being because their, you know, their UI, UX, they've been able to build a little bit more quietly and, and build more in the background. Um, and they've been been excellent to have on board. They're, they're a great group too. And are they their kind of like own entity or have you guys like funded them at all or how is that relationship uh, built? I, I honestly don't know what the, I don't know what the that situation looks like on a mutable side. Um, but I know that the, the, the higher ups that be at Token Trove and the higher ups that be at Immutable have a very good working relationship. So Awesome. Awesome. Love yeah. to hear it. So uh, real quick here for the hunters, scouts and workers, are you able to kind of talk about what the purpose of pets are at all? And then if you want to kind of specifically what those class roles do? Yeah. So essentially pets are, are creatures that you can like, you, you can bind them to your team of heroes as you go into a dungeon, right? Um, and they give a variety of different benefits. So You've got the workers, um, and what they ha what they do is they have passive generation of crafting resources. You've got your scouts, and they increase a dungeon item drop chance, and your hunters, which increase rewards at, like when you complete a dungeon. So the beauty of this, we think, is we want to facilitate a number of people. You know, People have their own thesis about how this game will be best played, what the meta is, how they can make the most, how they can compete the most, how can they climb the leaderboards. All we want to do is facilitate the foundation of that. So we say, here's a few different opportunities to be able to go in and grab these things. Um, and you can then go and do what you want. If you decide that you want to go all in on workers because you think that generation passively of resources to craft means that you have a quicker loop or a quicker time to get those items on the marketplace to make money, which is then a rate back, which then means you progress. You might go all in on workers and, and just fill your guild and fill your, fill your team with them. Or you might think that scouts is the way to go. And then what you start seeing is this nice in-game economic loop whereby I'm going to go and be selling things. You're going to be buying things that I want to give you or that you need from me and I want to be buying things from you. And then person X over here on the other side of the planet says, I need that hunter pet. I want to go and buy that, blah, 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 blah. So like essentially on the baseline, creatures that you can take into a dungeon with you to help you with a number of different things is the way to think about it. And then you guys also have different factions within the game itself, where there's Empire, Glade, and Horde. And yep. how do they intermingle? Because I know that it's kind of like something that you were saying where, you know, there's hunters, scouts, and they're able to, you know, be able to focus on specific resources that somebody else is going to need. Do you guys have that also built into these different factions? So factions are basically, they're basically groups that will determine the general type of hero. So, for example, like humans will, will typically be an empire hero. Um, gotcha, gotcha. And then, you know, monsters will have... The, so when you go in, you battle bosses, you battle monsters. They will have... Excuse me. They will have strengths and weaknesses against certain factions. And you don't know what they are, right? So it's like... It, <laughs> we'll figure, so we'll it, figure it out. You have to go and learn. <laughs> um, and then you've also got... This is the cool... In my opinion, this is the coolest thing. So your heroes... Basically, the heroes from the different factions have access to different drop tables. So it, the, the strategy, it adds this layer of strategy to the game where, again, it goes back to what I said with the pets, right? It goes back to the heroes. It goes back to the, the comps that you want to do with your team and the guilds that you run with. What you're starting to see just from this conversation is that 
we want to facilitate these really sort of intricate ladders that people can climb. And, you know, we want to go and facilitate this gaming experience for the hardcore free-to-play gamer who thinks that they can grind to the top. Um, and they, they believe that because of their knowledge of game theory and their background playing mobile RPGs, they know the way to play, right? We also want to facilitate for the mythic guild owner who says, I have no interest in gaming, but I see the economic benefit of employing 50 people to work in this guild and to let them go and do their thing, right? We, you know, I like, my background's not fully in gaming. I've always been like an FPS gamer with my friends. My background's in sports broadcasting. That was what I grew up doing. I'm a massive NBA fan, right? But awesome. when I came on board with this project, you know, a year and four months ago, I think now, like I was intoxicated straight away, not only from the in-game <laughs> asset ownership side, but also when they started pitching the game and the way that they were doing it, it was like, hey, I, I can understand. It, it ticks, you know, it, it satisfies so many elements of things that you are looking for in a project that it's like, What's going to stand out, right? What's going to be here in two years, five years, 10 years? And why? Why is it different? Um, and the, the more I started getting into it and starting to see this community grow and started to, as the white paper built out, we changed the tokenomics, we changed the supply of tokens, the partnerships that we're signing, the partnerships that are going to be announced, like we start seeing this ecosystem and this cloud grow and grow and grow. Um, and it's pretty wild, to be honest with you. Like we're in a we're in a nut situation right now. Yeah, it's exciting, and that, and that's why one of the reasons why I wanted to get together and do this is because I think that it's going to be cool to be able to look back and say, hey, you know, at this point, this is where we were, and then now we're here, and it, and it's awesome having that opportunity to look back. And you were speaking a moment ago about the you know person that would say, hey, like I just want to get a guild, and then have people that want to play, and you know that's that. When you're building out these guilds, can you give us kind of a behind the scenes look? Because I, I don't really know how it works, because, for example, I have like five or six guilds and I'm like, OK, so I'm going to need to populate them with other users. Is it something that's going to be easy to do? Is it only something that I can focus on one of them and then I have to sell the other ones? How does it really kind of work when you are trying to uh, recruit for a guild? So there's a number of different ways to, to answer this question, I think. What we've seen, uh, you know, the coolest thing that we've seen is that um, some of the big the big guilds are already paying like thousand dollar referral bonuses for people who are like, you know, my buddy is is a weapon mobile gamer. You should get in touch with him. And then if they then go and I don't know, use the word hire, bring in, recruit, whatever that person for their guild, they pay that referral bonus to the referee. Um, in our Discord channel, we've got a guild recruitment. Um, sub channel which just pops off right you got people yourself you might jump in there and say hey i've got an adventurous guild i'm looking for people in i don't know north like pacific time zone for example or i live in the philippines i need people in sort of apac time zone roughly and i want people who can commit x number of hours a week to the game are you interested in joining my guild right so you start seeing these like the, the coolest part in my opinion is i have no idea who you are you have no idea who they are they have no idea who this person is but these little groups start getting built and so in the last week, I've joined, I think, five or six guild Discord communities, right? To go and just see what's going on, say hello, see what's happening. And then within these channels, there's like this family being built. They're giving each other alpha on different projects. They're saying, hey, this leak's just come out from GOG. What do you think about buying this pet? Do we want to have this pet? What do we think? Like, you know, it's it's a game within a game and we're still months from live ops. I don't know any other project that facilitates that. Um, and then also has this underlying product, which we think is going to be, you know, you've got your axes, you've got your different games where I'm not going to knock anyone in the space building because I think that everyone sort of is working towards the same thing. But um, speaking with some bias, I think that GOG has got the most compelling gameplay element of, of any um, play and earn game that I've seen in the space developing well the last years. The aspect of people putting referral bonuses out for that already seems kind of crazy, but is it something where you're going to need to put in that much or that many hours to be able to facilitate that? Or are they just trying to be assured that they have people that are going to be like committed per se? No, no. I think, I think that's just more those people who are, they want to lock their group in early and they want to do that. Like there's going to be, there'll be in-game opportunities to join guilds if you're just a free-to-play player who wants to join one. So so there is going to be that kind of thing where if you don't use like Discord or anything like that, you can just find like a menu and, well, you know, looking yeah. for guild. There will be there will be that element built in, yeah. Okay, awesome, awesome. So uh, back to the faction aspect, 
when you join a guild, are you forced to join a faction? Because I know in Star Atlas, I had to pick between like three different factions or whatever. Um, and apparently you're not able to change that. So is that the case where, you know, if you buy uh, or if you get into a guild, that's like, hey, we're like a horde guild. We, you know, have to use those type of heroes or we have to play on those type of dungeons or how does that aspect work? No, so it's the faction that you're in does not dictate the, um, you know, it, it doesn't lock you into a group, right? Because the hero themselves have a faction and class element, right, right? So, whichever hero you're playing with at the time, that's the that's the faction, that's the class, that's the um, the style of hero that you're running at that at that given point. If that makes sense. Can so you not- use multiple one? Oh, like, sorry. So if I have like a horde and a glade a hero, can I use them together in the same team or no? Yeah, you can. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, ha- that- what's the deciding factor for between the two factions? Like, is it the hero that I pick first? Oh, so at the time, so when you, when the game launches at first live ops, you'll go into a dungeon with four heroes, right? Your, your team will be four heroes. Your comp will be four heroes. And at any, any given time, you control one and you can swap between and then the other three are AI controlled. Gotcha. And then, but like for the rewards, because you said a second ago that it was based off of what faction you're in yep. for like the different dungeons. Is that based off the hero or is that you look at a dungeon and they say, hey, this is, you know, oh, the glade right. one. Um, and so you're going to get rewards from that faction. I need to I need to double check the easiest way to answer that. It's probably something that I should flag with Josiah in terms of. Uh, okay, for sure, for sure. No worries I'm, at all. No worries I'm at all. Back with the um, I've just got the white paper up. I'm just looking at the specifics to do with it. Um, yeah, no worries at all. No worries. So one other thing that you guys have been doing that I think super um, intriguing is having one of ones, and I'm curious. <laughs> Are these things just going to one hit dungeons? Like how powerful are they? Is this more of kind of a flex? Obviously, the floor on these ones are pretty, pretty high, but they are all listed. Um, But it's I I mean, I don't know. Break down what these mythics are all about. So these are founder edition heroes. There's a a scarce number of these. Right. And we release them. They have different tiers. So you got your legendaries, your rares, your epics. Um, And with for example, the legendary heroes, we sold seven and a half thousand of each and they'll never be sold again. They have a founder tag. That's it. Um, so with the mythics, this is the wild part about it is they're purely cosmetic. They're just chromas. That's it. So they have no stat buffs. There's nothing better about them, right? Legendary heroes are slightly more powerful than epics, which are slightly more powerful than rares. But there's chromas within the legendary tier. So you got your mythics, warriors, elites, um, and they're, they're purely chromas. And so this was a nod to early adopters to say, if this game blows up to 50 million DAU, which is, you know, we have a goal of that. We think it's completely achievable. And you have your hands on one of the first 7,500 7, legendary heroes founder edition, right? Look at what Genesis axes are, or the mystic axes, and then 10 exit in terms of scarcity. That's the, that's the sort of level that we're playing on here. And so you look at these mythics, they were one of one of each founder hero that was sold. So we had a mythic Leah that sold for 250,000 US dollars um, like three or four months ago. Holy these, moly. <laughs> so these are like, these are collections. These are relics. These are things that you're basically banking on this project going to the moon. And then you hold one of the rarest pieces of in-game accessory on the planet. And that's, that's crazy. Thing, that's, and that goes back to the very core of NFT gaming. What other game can you do that in, right? The, the traditional gaming model that we've grown up with does not facilitate anything like this. And people wonder whether or not it's here to stay. It's like, mate, it's not here to stay. It's it is, <laughs> is what it's going to be. Like it's, there's no, there's, in my mind, there is no future where this is not the foundation of how gaming's done. So with these being chromas, I want to kind of go through here and figure out if I'm trying to go for the top tier of power, right? Like if I'm trying to get the best hero, it would be an elite and then it would be a legendary. Is that correct? So a legendary elite or elite legendary. And these are the top of the top of the top in terms of like scale of how powerful uh, the hero is. So if you look down the left side, so you got if you click the drop down on rarity, so you've got legendary, you've got rares, you've got epics. So the top tier of hero is a legendary hero. 
they're slightly more powerful than epics and there's less of them epics are slightly more powerful than rare <clears throat> and there's less epics than legendaries but more epics than rares and then rare is slightly less powerful than epics and there's more of them that's that's how the founder sale worked when the game's live obviously this isn't going to be enough heroes and they're you know obviously the game wouldn't work if we had 30 heroes only so there's bunches and bunches and bunches being built and prod in the background right now <clears throat> so there will be more legendary heroes released there will be more epic heroes released more rares <clears throat> sorry and if you're a free to play player you start the game with a common hero so it's you're in a situation here where again it facilitates the idea where you can go and do what you want from a thesis standpoint and say i want to stack rares because i think that you know i think if from a price entry point rares i can get this many of them the other element that we should touch on is that you can merge heroes so once you ascend to a certain level you can merge heroes to go up to a stronger version of that hero so again you're starting to see gameplay elements strategy elements start to work in but yes the ladder goes like that on the special edition so if you click the drop down below the rarity you've got normals which is the base level of the rarity so you've got normal legendaries normal epics and normal rares you've got your warrior which is a rarer chroma 10 percent are warrior editions then you've got your elite which is two and a half percent and then you've got your mythic which is a one of one does that make sense yeah, I'm following along. I, I, and I mean, you're saying that there's not really too much of a difference between them, but is it going to be something where it's going to be really worth it to have? Because I know that, you know, down the line, you guys are wanting to have these raids and whatnot, but I'm assuming when the game comes out, you guys are going to have not like way less of an experience, but kind of like a focused, hey, here is like a portion of the game and then, you know, expand it and release it as time goes on. No, so the, the goal... Basically, the goal with these, these hero elements was that we didn't want to make them overpowered. <clears throat> but if you were taking the investment risk on of buying or investing in rarer and scarcer heroes, then you should be rewarded slightly for that. So having slightly stronger stats, that's, that's it, kind of fundamental. And so everything we do from an economic standpoint is pointed towards balancing those two competing dichotomies. And do you guys have anything planned for people that have certain rarities or certain aspects right so in the in the nft world right now we're seeing a lot of hey if you own this asset of our collection you're able to get you know early access on this drop or you know you have this token drop which you guys have done and we can talk about that in a minute but is there going to be anything incentive wise for future drops you guys do for having certain assets or is it going to be similar like the founder sale where it's going to kind of just be open on the website for anybody i <clears throat> i can't disclose Okay, fair. Love it. <laughs> we, we, keep some things, we keep some things mysterious. You're a very good interviewer. Um, but people need to... Yeah, I'll, I'll just keep it quiet. Hell yeah. Okay, cool. So let me uh, now bring up something that I recently bought. I decided, hey, listen, Guild of Guardians, they came out with these avatars. I decided to get a whole bunch of these orc here. But I wanted to break it down for me. You guys decided that you were going to drop 10,000 avatars which i don't think anybody expected from a couple different standpoints just the fact that you guys were doing that and then the scarcity aspect of it you guys really did something that i think everyone that you know got one was like oh wow this is really cool so explain how you guys decided who was going to get dropped these ten thousand, and how long these have been in the works for so th this was actually a baby of mine. This was a project that the game lead and I did. So Derek Lau, who's a gun, who basically runs the project, been in NFTs for five years. Um, we decided that a cool thing to give back to the community would be at a certain point, we would take a snapshot of any single person who held a GOG asset in a wallet. And we took a snapshot of all those wallets, ended up being 10,000. We hit it at a nice sweet spot. And these things we we ideated and built through um, you know the, the back end of last year. It took us about three months probably. Built up the concepts. We thought that we wanted to fit things that were loosely in character with with you know the, the poly aesthetic of the heroes and the guilds and the dungeons that we were trying to run, and then go and build out something cool. Um, it was a nice bridge between the community and sort of the NFT meta with the PFP side, but we also didn't want people to pay for them. So we thought we'll run proper rarities. We'll run it as a proper PFP project. But instead of people going and minting them, we'll just airdrop to them. We'll airdrop them for free. 
some of these have sold for 10 ETH. So, you know, some people have made 50 Gs just because of which, <laughs> yeah. um, which is cool and that's great. Um, but, you know, I think that you look at something like this and it goes back to the concept of scarcity. The game gets to 50 million users and you're, you've got one of the only 10,000 PFPs of the game being held as an NFT in your wallet. Another way to monetize yourself and monetize your brand, monetize your game. So it was a bit of a no-brainer for us. We it, it sits in line with our concept of giving back to the community. I think overall last year we gave out about one and a half mil to two mil US back to the community in referral rewards, in tokens, in I mean sorry, with tokens it was about twenty five mil US. Um, just at the core of everything we do, it's it's how can I treat person X and person Y as an investor in what we're trying to build. Um, so if you can pat them on the head and look after them and give them things and incentivize them to keep coming back, spreading the name of the game, that's kind of how you get onto a winner. And I think a lot of projects fall over because they don't put the community at the forefront of what they're doing. It's money first. It's it's how can we make more noise instead of how can we treat people like humans who are trying to align themselves with what we're doing. Um, and if I if you do if 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 I say so myself, I reckon the avatars like they look dope. I reckon they, they look, look sweet. Yeah, they, they I, look I love them. I love them. Yeah. There, and seeing everybody do the hashtag GOG morning out here on Twitter and start representing, it's cool that you get to uh, kind of see who's, you know, I think the whole digital identity thing, people people are underrating. They're like, I know that we went through the whole phase of, oh, yeah, like, the, you know, the, they're not going to end up having value. They're just photos for stuff before. But I don't know, dude, like, I, I think a lot of the stuff is going to end up being huge. And I know we're short on time. So I the last thing I kind of want to talk about is the token drop that you guys did recently, but also this community milestone, because it seems like more gems are are going to be uh, released and your guys uh, wording for the Guild of Guardians token is gem. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. So you'll hear, you'll hear gems or GOG tokens spoken about. They're the same thing. Um, it's just gems are more accessible and make more sense to mobile gamers. You, you People know what they are more, but um, the gem or the GOG token, the same thing. They're the in-game currency. They're all, it's also tradable as, a, as an ARC20 token. And you guys did like a huge drop for the entire community for that. Uh, how come you guys did that? And what were like the parameters for uh, getting that token drop? Yeah, so we, we had this in place from the beginning. I mean, if we, if we actually went back and, and did this again, we kind of mucked up a, a couple of things. We built out this white paper. We built this idea from day one and the game blew up without us. Like we scaled so quickly. We ended up selling about 13 mil US in primary sale assets. So if you look, this milestone cutoff was at 10 mil. So the people who bought in wave three from price point 10 mil to 13 mil actually missed out on earning tokens back. So we're, we're having internal conversations about how we can do this better. But essentially, the goal was to give back of the total supply pool 1.4% of gems to people who invested early in the game. They took the risk. We needed to look after them. So um, at the end of last year, just before Christmas, we distributed... Um, I can't remember what the exact figure was. I think it was about 30-something million tokens back to people who had invested in the game. Um, sorry, not 30 million. It was 14 million, 1.4% uh, of, of the total supply pool. So um, they're tradable. They're, they have full currency. They have full value. The token's trading at $1.50 US at the moment. So we gave back, you do the maths, it's around 20 mil US at the moment back to our community. So it was important for us to reward people who had said, I see this project, I see what they're doing. It's very early, but I'm going to back them and I'm going to invest in them. So it's the the future of, of, of gaming. It's the future of sort of the play and earn business model. And we're sort of proud to, to champion things like that. But people need to also understand that they haven't missed the boat yet. Like we are so early in our life cycle. Um, and there's a, a lot to come in 2022. There's things that I can't say that I wish I could say, but we we have an exciting future ahead of us. Yeah, listen, Nick, this has been a killer episode one here for Into the Guild, guys. I appreciate you tuning in. We're going to be doing this pretty much bi-weekly uh, and maybe uh, some different ones here or there or in between. You never know. Whenever a cool announcement comes out, maybe we'll try to get together and do a quick little update on that. Uh, but, Nick, thanks for taking the time, and uh, I'll see you super soon, boss. No worries. I'm going to be on a lot with you, so let's run it up. Hell yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for watching. We'll chat soon. Peace, peace.